good evening to all of our viewers. This is a special presentation on Adhra 24 on Sri Lanka's current economic situation, where we are heading and how we got to this specific place. Uh, to give us a holistic view of this entire story uh, is someone that we have spoken to uh, consistently and has like given many predictions that have actually come true in uh, the today's day and age. Dr. Kenneth De Silva, Senior Economist and Business Cycles Analyst at Econsult Asia. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining me today. Uh, looking forward for a very important discussion. Um, doctor, as we start this conversation, I want to get your clarification. Actually, just give a more general approach to this and then we'll go into specifics. What is your reading of where we are right now? Where, how, I, I think a lot of people have their own interpretations of how we got here. But where are we right now? What is the most immediate step we need to be taking? Uh, how do you really like break this down? Thanks, Danidu, for having me. Great to be here once again. Uh, well, I mean, you rightly said that we spoke about this many times. So probably we have to get back to some of what we have been discussing so that the viewers also understand the context that yeah. where we are and how we have come here. Uh, I mean, so there is two different types of models out there now. And the initial model that was uh, projected for a suitable uh, development path of this country was the model based on production. Now we are traversing into, we are Dish, uh, kind of move that away and now we are getting into a more a trading model is what my current read is. Right. Now there are two reasons for what I'm, why I'm saying that. Uh, the production model uh, was a model that uh, was used by many of the East Asian economies that saw that through the journey of production, industrialization uh, is a function of that. You find that you create sufficient and export base which is of high value and you have markets that kind of are ready to absorb this kind of production. That is one side. Secondly, also the domestic side, you find that domestic production, particularly the domestic capital base tends to increase. And once that capital base increases, the retained profits contribute to the national balance sheet. Only through strengthening the national balance sheet can you strengthen your cash flows and in turn service the external debt component. Now what we have done is we have said no thank you to that growth model and we are adopting a model based on the recommendations of IMF and they are currently in the driving seat determining the economic policies for the country. Now that model, part of that model is they look at debt sustainability and they want us to reduce our overall debt exposure, both domestic debt and foreign, foreign debt. debt. Yeah. Uh, so that journey has already started and the process is already in place and we are on that path now. Now that path is a fairly uh, dangerous path as you probably can see right now as to what's happening in this country. A painful uh, path. A yes. very painful path. And there is no light at the end of the tunnel. I'll tell you why. Because Greece went to the IMF and they're still not sorted out their debt to GDP ratio. In fact, their debt to GDP ratio has got worse. Yeah. It's 252% of GDP. Yeah. Right? All economic indicators are very badly placed. If you look at capital formation, market capitalization, their GDP growth. Uh, their current account balances, all that apart from inflation, every other indicator is in negative territory. So the Greece story is something that we have to be cognizant about. Similarly, if you, f if you look at what happened in Ghana, Ghana also is no different, right? So there are ample examples of this particular path, which is carted by the IMF, being one of extreme danger for this country and the painful process of austerity is something that this country has not gone through to its full context. Yeah. Right? I think we started to adopt some kind of austerity back in 2016 and then as you saw the results of that, people got tired of it 
and by 2019 there was a approach say that we need to get back to something which is more viable and more attainable and less painful for the domestic economy particularly dom domestic capitalist uh, so that's how we got to the homegrown model yeah. and the production model yeah now we're back to where we started in 2016 we adopted the imf path and now we are currently traversing down that and i mean you you can see the adjustments yeah. uh, across the board right um uh, dr indra i think uh, i've heard uh, philosopher slavo zizek once said uh, if you if if there is a train that is coming uh, as in if there is a light at the end of the tunnel is probably a train that is coming from the other end is probably what what we are seeing in adopting this sort of neoclassical sort of model now doctor uh, within the programming lineup here we have tried to reach out and i think you have also seen we tried to reach out to a number of economists around the world about why and th there was one pertinent question that we wanted to understand why is s such an organization which maybe n maybe they don't have a lack when it comes to merit in terms of who joins that organization i believe graduates and everyone why is such an ideology still being pushed and why are we buying into it maybe that's a local issue but why is such an ideology still being pushed i want to just get us maybe a short answer there and we'll go into a few technical things that are happening in the country yeah i mean the ideology is a very strong ideology that has been pushed by uh, many of the western developed world uh, that's unfortunate because the alternative uh, teachings have not been uh, been taught in any universities or in schools yeah and that's a huge vacuum that we find currently not only in sri lanka globally it's the same yeah uh, so the imf which consists of about 2300 uh, staff across the world which they are in about i think i think 170 or 180 countries have a strangular hold on the global economy and right. they they kind of play the role i mean their role has been questioned um, uh, multiple times and you know uh, even in the even even the west there is been a lot of discussion around it but nevertheless they still command a fair amount of uh, uh, discourse because also they are supported by the us government itself right. because imf shareholding currently 18% of it is currently held by the us uh, then we have japan and then we have china yeah. uh, so out of the total membership so the voice is very strong and it's done predominantly to look at ensuring that the west has access to raw materials yeah. that is the main focus to ensure that there is less competition at the top and there is more competition at the bottom so that there is a there is competition for raw materials and with that raw materials the raw material prices do tend to be at a very low base yeah. and as a result of that low raw material prices the developing countries find it extremely difficult to industrialize yeah. and therefore they get into this vicious cycle of getting into debt because they have to bridge their trade deficit and that perennial trade deficit causes them to go to external sources either the multilateral agencies or bilateral sources or capital markets and predominantly many of the developing countries have gone to both routes through multilateral agencies and to capital markets and they have paid the price right uh doctor just to i think that that gives a clarification as to what the motivations are let's just talk a bit about our country now we just to push back on some things that you're mentioning um we saw that there was a slight appreciation of the dollar in the in in, in the later recent past and the credit was being given uh which holistically when you look at it you would understand certain reasons but a lot of credit was being given okay now this the the model that you said was trade actually i didn't have a term for it there was there was a certain term of production industrial policy led sort of growth that we were looking at before and now uh, as you mentioned it's sort of like a looking at trade if you can explain that a bit more yeah. further also uh why did we see that appreciation what is your uh, observation on that if you can okay. start there uh, so right i mean the appreciation is good i mean i i for one uh, welcome the currency appreciating because our currency has a direct impact on our inflation yeah. and we saw that uh, in the last uh, yeah. year when they depreciated the currency by 80% uh, 
uh, inflation also picked up almost by 80 percent. And that was the fundamental motivation behind holding the dollar also? Yes, that, yeah. I mean at that time I think the, uh, the government in charge of uh, the overall macro policy uh, and the people in charge uh, took a very uh, calculated uh, uh, kind of view on the implication of the national balance sheet. We are not looking at one particular aspect of the cash flow. Yeah. If you target remittances and you think that depreciating the currency will bring rapid net remittances and help stimulate tourism, sadly it is not. And the numbers can be seen now. Yeah, even in that, even in their field, that didn't work. Is it because like it even didn't work. If looking at the figures, we saw that there was a drop in the remittances in the initial stages, yeah. Yeah. and then there was a sort of like a plateau. Absolutely. So compared to 2021, sorry, 2022, yeah. uh, remittances have increased. Yeah. That's that's okay, but not as high as we've seen back in 2020 and 2019. If you look at the numbers, sorry, 2019, 2018, because 2020 we had COVID. Yeah. If you look at the numbers correspondingly, it is not as high. Yeah. Uh, so there is a deficit in terms of the cash flows that you generate from tourism as well as uh, remittances. Now, uh, so answer your question to the two parts of it. The first part is that, and the second part is the rupee appreciation. Why that happened was uh, that many of our external debt servicing has been stopped. Right. So there is no cash outflow. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, all the service related payments also have not gone to like dividend payouts uh, for banking sector has not been done. And then uh, people traveling out of the country uh, has, uh, has limited, right, and etc. So then the gross cash flow, even though it's fairly higher than the uh, previous year, yep. the overall net cash also has increased because of the lack of economic activity and also because of the restrictions on imports. Right. So all that is good. Yep. I mean, all that is good, currency appreciating is good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the economy is out of danger and the economy has transformed itself to becoming more uh, cash generating and more uh, a growth oriented story is a miss in this. Yeah, yeah. Doctor, I want to get your clarification there. Just just before we go in for a break, the are we are we really looking at a model where we can really change this sort of trajectory like in terms of predictions? Where do you see us heading? Because we saw recently even Fitch had mentioned this sudden appreciation is not something that is that will be sustainable. Now Initially, Doctor, when, when we were discussing this within like um, multiple programs here, you had consistently mentioned that a sustainable growth, we are looking at over maybe 10, 15 years of growth where there should be a platform, a production economy that is established and we'll be reaping the benefits in the future. In the current model, what is the prediction? Where are we heading? Is it is that, uh, I think you mentioned trade, uh, we are seeing a bit of a push towards uh, the service sector. Uh, that is tourism primarily. And there is a bit of a conversation on the IT sector and everything, which we haven't seen the infrastructure going in that no. direction, but we have seen that conversation happening. What are your predictions in terms of this specific trajectory? Yeah, so as I said, I mean, our economy as a whole is about 65% service related economy. Yeah. Uh, so it's a tough uh, one to change structurally. Yeah. And in, within that service uh, environment, uh, economic structure, uh, you have IT services also as part of yeah. that, IT yeah. banking, etc. Yeah. Now, IT services, since you mentioned it, uh, I'm quite concerned about it because we have changed our fiscal stance on the IT sector. We have increased our telecommunications taxes. Yeah. We have taken away the incentive for uh, telecommunications and uh, other services associated with telecommunications to function yeah. from a corporate taxation point of view. We, we had it at zero taxation. Now they, I think, brought it back to 30. All exemptions have been cancelled. So we are targeting a single number in terms of our tax to re tax to revenue uh, tax revenue to GDP number. Basically, a fiscal approach to this. It's a fiscal approach. Yeah, yeah. So the taxation policy is is 
it has to be aligned with what you're trying to do in terms of the macroeconomy and the structure of the economy. Yeah. Now that was what we saw in the previous model, in the production model, the taxation policy fitted that production model because the incentives were given for production. Right. Manufacturing was incentivized, fisheries were incentivized, IT was incentivized, the, the corporate taxation was a key component of that pillar of incentivizing yeah. capital formation. Now that takes time to kick in, but the results were shown. I mean, if you yeah. look at the annual report of the central bank, you will see that gross fixed capital formation increased from 2020 to 2021 as a result of that. And also GDP increased as well. Yeah. Right, so we went into that trough and then we came out of it in 2021. And 2022, if that same policy continued, I think the results would have been different. Right. I mean, we, sh we shouldn't have gone into a, a de default structure. That is my personal belief. Yeah. Uh, there are many views expressed on that. That's also fine. Uh, because the repercussions of doing that is enormous, because particularly from a capital markets point of view and access to credit, it really kills you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, doctor, I think multiple areas that you opened, really, I want to like get into details uh, in. Uh, we'll take a very short break. You're watching this special presentation on Other 24. We are in conversation with Dr. Kenneth De Silva. Stay with us. Back to this special presentation on Adhan 24, we are talking about the Sri Lankan economy, the story of where we got to this specific location and where we can go from this point onwards, just to prioritize the entire solutions aspect of all of this. We are in conversation with Dr. Kenneth De Silva. Doctor, um, a very important first segment that we just passed in terms of where we are. And uh, I want to get a bit of uh, your insights on the debt issue within the country. Now, we saw uh, which according to how we saw it, the default, the decision to default was actually a colossal, um, let's say an error in terms of how, how Sri Lanka was addressing its economic issues. With that approach, we didn't see the kind of, uh, at least the coverage in happening about what exactly was the repercussions of this specific default. Uh, anyhow, we now see the conversation on debt restructuring going forward. A mm. lot of people wouldn't really understand this yeah. term, debt restructuring. Uh, before we had the terms like hair yeah, cut being thrown around right. and, uh, and us rolling over our debt. Uh, in, in that mix, and we also saw in, in the recent past that it was in fact brought to our light that there was an alternate sort of bailout package being arranged with China, which wasn't really like spoken about at all. In, in all of that, we are in the midst of this negotiation mm. with the IMF. What exactly is our approach or should our approach be to this conversation on debt restructuring? Yeah, so debt restructuring typically entails a mix of two things in various permutations. One is you, you look at uh, extending the tenor of the debt stock. Then there is another painful process where you go to the lenders and you negotiate a, a kind of a reduction in the payable to yeah. them, which is what we call a haircut. Yeah. And then you also look at a reduction in the interest cost. Now the interest cost is, particularly in bonds, is the coupon that you are fixed. Yeah. It's not the secondary market price of 47%, which is out there, yeah. that is a secondary market rate. But the guy who has bought this, who has the coupon, who receives the coupon, they will say we'll reduce the coupon price of the coupon value of the bond. So it's a mix of these three in tenor, capital yeah. and interest. Now that struct that that is a painful discussion because it takes years for it to be discussed. We have to get all the lenders to the negotiating table and also the most carrier parties. Uh, what we are seeing in places like Argentina, Argentina took a 50% haircut. Right. The, the lenders took a 50% haircut, right, which was brokered by the IMF. Uh, and they still got into more debt yeah. after that. Sri Lanka is no different, right. right? If you look at the debt numbers, in fact, from where we were, our total debt stock has increased okay. from 13 trillion rupees to 25 trillion. That is in a place where we don't pay 
we don't repay also. Yeah, yeah we, we are, are not, we are not servicing our debt. Debts, yeah. And on top of that, we are going into more debt. And I recently saw, uh, in fact, for pharmaceuticals and for other types of medicines and whatnot, uh, we have got another 400 million credit from the World Bank and IFC, which is also debt, right. which needs to be paid. Okay. So we are actually adding to our debt stock and we are not getting away from the pain. Now, I debt, as I said previously, uh, taking debt is no problem, so, so long as you can manage the cash flows that you get from this debt, because in any company, there is a debt to equity mix, and based on that, you look at the revenue that you're generating. Now, in Sri Lanka's case, your debt stock has increased, there is no equity component, and your revenue has declined, because your GDP has come down by n a negative 8% last year, this year negative 4%, and I think next year will be also tough. Yeah. We saw a similar uh, development in Greece. Right. Greece, towards uh, during a 13-year period, had a negative GDP of 2.6% average. During, I think, 2005 to uh, 15 or probably to 18, yeah. uh, the average GDP was negative 2.6%. Okay. So 13 years, negative growth. So that's the painful process of a debt restructuring. And on top of that, as I said before, Greece has still not reduced its debt. So we see a similar pattern emerging in Sri Lanka, where your debt stock has increased, you're still in the midst of a negotiation with uh, the lenders, yeah. and that would also result in the lenders, to some extent, asking for equal treatment on domestic debt, right. which there is a term in bond language we call it, or in credit terms, there is a, a, a term that is used called paripasu treatment. Right. Paripasu means you have to treat all equally, Okay. right? Equal standing. So that paripasu treatment, if by any chance is imposed on domestic debt, then there is significant pain. Because remember, EPF and ETF and central bank hold a significant portion of that debt, okay. the domestic debt. Uh, so I'm hoping that that doesn't happen but we have to wait and see because these negotiations have just taken place. So that's the danger in the restructure, as I see it now. But it's still early stages. It depends on how hard we negotiate it, and I hope competent people within the central bank and the government are there to you know, take a bit more pragmatic view on this. Yeah. Uh, because as I said, if that happens, a lot of the banks will be affected. The banking system, financial stability, will be impaired. Right. That's the danger that I hope that won't happen, but we can never know. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Doctor, putting that into perspective, I just want to take a step back from the macro sort of economic lens that we're looking at this and look at the micro elements that the people on a day-to-day -day basis have to face. Now, we saw uh, once the rupee was allowed to float, there was a massive uh, inflation rise and in a way, commodities, commodity prices went up in a massive scale. Then we again saw, which was not really like observed, let's say, <laughs> by most people, was that there was another level where the rupee was again held yeah. at a certain level. Uh, and then within what was then called a, a, a peg, but not a soft peg, rather. Yeah. Um, I, I want to get your take on what, what that is also. Uh, in, in, that, in that context, I also want to like, uh, maybe this is like a two-parter, a bit of an explanation there and talk a bit about the interest rates right mm. now. Um, I think we can really like move into the international element also after this. Right. The interest rates which on the last monetary uh, policy review, uh, which we didn't expect to happen was that there was an increase in the interest rates as in the first standard uh, lending rates. Uh, which has a sort of like a trickle down effect on the banks and sure. the interest rates that are given afterwards. What exactly is the impact there? Because the to, to push back on what you have been mentioning, just to take the idea of you know what this the the current sort of administration is taking is we need to have the interest rates high to control inflation and we will keep it high until there is a uh, observable maybe like a, a sustainable reduction in inflation is the sort of. I guess the textbook sort mm. of argument that is going around. Mm. What are your comments on those two things? Firstly, on the rupee float and where it has been left. Because uh, just to maybe like just to add on to the first question, doctor, is it such a bad thing to hold the rupee at a certain level for extended periods of time? Yeah, I mean, the 
whether to free flow the currency or whether to peg it, it's a it's a broader discussion, and there are uh, other parameters that go into that decision making process. Yeah. Now, I will talk about the uh, the era where the peg was at two hundred and two, yeah, and then yeah. gradually uh, was shifted upward. I think that that was a conscious decision because the repercussions of a depreciation was quantified yeah. in terms of the impact on debt stock because yeah. a one rupee increase on a fifty four billion uh, dollar total debt outstanding is 54 billion rupees yeah. in terms of additional financing for the government, which means that higher taxes have to be imposed on the people. No question about that. Yeah. Right? So that's, that you can see is already happening and that's why you find the monetization of our uh, rupee depreciation has happened and we are, our debt stock has increased to 25 trillion now. As at right. November 2022, right. December numbers will be much higher, but that's the trajectory. So therefore, the depreciation should be carefully managed. Okay. And no country does that, you know, at the flip of a coin, sort of. And countries should do that. I think that was one of the reasons where the IMF came in back in 1945, was to prevent bigger thy neighbor policies by way of depreciation during that era yeah. and then they went into a fixed exchange rate regime yeah. right, till the market stabilized. So similarly Sri Lanka also adopted a, a, a exchange rate policy on a stabilization front. Right. Looking at the variables, looking at the debt stock, looking at our exports, looking at where we are and kept the rate at a point where we were still competitive. Yeah. The, the real effective exchange rate was still within acceptable norms of being fairly competitive. Now, so that was done to ensure that we had a stable platform to take off in yeah. terms of not excessive inflation, uh, controlled inflation, because the pass-through coefficient is very significant, and also to ensure that as a result of managing that external shock, you manage interest rates, the monetary policy. Okay. Right? Because any movement in the exchange rate has a direct impact on obviously inflation, cost push inflation starts to kick in. Yeah. As we saw, it happened as you 80% depreciated. Yeah. Everything blew out of the window, right? And then you saw profitability also get hammered. And as a result of that profitability, you get compounded further. Uh, your profitability is impacted further because your debt servicing now is increasing because your cost of debt by way of the transmission mechanism via the interest rate has also overshot. This is on a domestic level. On saying. the domestic level. For like the daily, not daily wage earners, but like the entrepreneurs who want to build a business Absolutely. and everything. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately the local capitalist base yeah. is needed for the country to move forward. And the fiscal policy that was in place was to look after that domestic capitalist who were keen in getting back into production, and we saw the result of that. I mean, yeah. one classic example, I can give several, but i give you one, was the uh, fisheries industry. We used to import tin fish. Yeah. We used to have, we had a requirement of, I think, 145,000 uh, 145, cans per day. Right. right? Or, sorry, 344,000 cans per day. And we used to only produce 66,000 cans per day balance was imported. Right. But we came to a point that we had a, we made good on that delivery and we managed to produce 344,000 cans during that period. So we were in the completely, as in the domestic consumption was met. Domestic consumption. So as a result of that, Ceylon fisheries, I mean fisheries exports yeah. was at an all time high. Yeah, I think we saw an almost exponential increase in export earnings. Absolutely, yeah. export earnings increased. Yeah. So that's the way to go. As a result of that macro policy framework, you found that once that cash flow comes into the system over a period of time, your debt serviceability is manageable. Yeah. And then our external debt, we had a number in place and that number was not to let it be more than three billion dollars a year to finance type yeah. of thing and you, I mean the trajectory was to get 
our, our external debt uh, to a manageable level and, and sovereign bonds, which are the most volatile part of it, to about $9 billion to $8 billion over the period that was at play. Right. Uh, but that didn't happen. So the exchange rate is an important variable. People yeah. look at it in isolation. As I said, there were lots of people lobbying behind doors for it to be depreciated because they wanted their uh, tourism income to increase and they wanted remittances uh, uh, income to increase in terms of rupee terms, but they didn't look at the cost, the real impact of that movement and because their disposable income was impacted yeah. because of inflation picked up correspondingly and therefore you were left with either being indifferent or badly off. Yeah. Uh, doctor, uh, another interesting aspect that we have always you know, enjoyed speaking to you on is the effect of the international community on what's happening in our country now. Uh, within our last segment, I want to give uh, a bit of time for this as well. But before we go there, I just want to get your clarification now. Though most people have sort of forgotten about this, there is a situation between Ukraine and Russia, which is uh, sort of, one would say, a pseudo sort of conflict created by the United States, which is happening between Ukraine and Russia. What are the direct or indirect impacts of that that we are witnessing as of now in terms of uh, how is it affecting our uh, how is it affecting the commodity prices here? Maybe we'll, we'll just go somewhere to those those micro levels. How is that affecting how we as a country function? How is that affecting our negotiations with the IMF also? Because this conversation comes up, I think it opens the door to a lot of things because we are looking at a world where most of the let's say East Asian countries, so at least uh, Russia, I think even in China, we see that they are taking a bit of a clinical approach to the reserves that they have, the US dollar reserves. Here, we don't see that conversation at all, but rather we are looking at increasing our dollar reserves and seeing maybe like few things as our only saving grace. If you can just give us a sort of picture about how those, those uh, incidences are impacting us and the trajectory these countries are taking, at least the alternate trajectory, uh, maybe like friendly nations with us, mm. as in uh, nations such as China, have been taking. How do you observe all that? Yeah, so the Ukrainian conflict, uh, I mean, the geopolitics is what it is. I mean, uh, it is there for multiple reasons and you get multiple versions of how that uh, sparked off. But in the bottom line in that is, it impacts world commodities because Ukraine is a supply of wheat and it impacts yeah. the food supply chain right across the world and you saw a huge spike in commodity prices. Uh, developing countries who are exposed to importing wheat and other uh, uh, particularly commodities uh, have to bear the brunt, yeah. including the rising crude oil prices. Uh, so I think that shock insulation was something that uh, many countries failed to manage. Yeah. Right, And you, you thought that it was going to be a quick war, but it was not necessarily a quick war. Now we are into the first year and it's still, there is no end in sight. Yeah. But these wars happen for a particular reason, and this reason is the, the jostling between powers in the overall business cycle. Yeah. So which power takes the dominant stance as, a end, as at the end of this war is the question. Now, I mean, so if you look at all the long business cycles, I've ended up with a global war somewhere or the other. Yeah. I mean, history has that very, very, very well documented. So this is no different. And at, at the end of this, I think since you brought up the two names uh, in terms of what China is doing, I think end of this, end of this particular conflict, I think China will uh, stand to benefit from this whole thing. And, your, and what, as you exactly rightly pointed out, many countries are now cognizant of the fact of the impact of having the dollar as a single reserve currency. Yeah. So they're diversifying from dollars, they're getting into gold, yeah. right? You find precious metals like gold appreciating significantly, and I won't be surprised that you'll find gold back again at 2,000 uh, troy ounce because that's the trajectory as we come to this. Uh, so all the the more more prudently managed countries and the more longer term oriented countries are looking at diversifying from the dollars. In fact. China had 1.2 trillion. I think they are now gradually reduced it to about 800 billion in terms of the exposure to uh, U.S. treasuries. Right, and they're moving for alternative reserve currencies, right. and I think that's the 
ultimate end that will happen just to get back to your question previous one was yeah, about uh, doctor uh, just I, i won't let you continue but we'll take a very short break and we can really like develop on that i want to talk a bit about the silicon valley bank issue also uh, you're watching other than 24 this is a special presentation on the sri lanka on sri lanka's economy stay with us back to this special presentation we are in conversation with dr kenneth de silva uh, doctor I, i i had interrupted you before when we were we were developing on the conversation on uh, foreign reserves and the kind of trajectory that other countries have been taking uh, if you can I, i believe we we won't have too much time to go in this segment but we'll just speak about that i'll just finish your thoughts on that and if you can give us a briefing on how exactly you know, there's a huge incident that's happening in the united states which a lot of the sri lankans are aware of of silicon valley bank which is uh, one of the biggest banks in mm. that country and mostly deals with venture capital and uh, deals with businesses there has failed and uh, the conversation has gone there how exactly is that going to impact our country as well if we can touch on those things yeah, i mean it's it's ironic because i mean here we have the the imf talking about uh, financial uh, governance and good governance and prudence in managing financial risk and then you find uh, uh not for the first time uh us banks collapsing yeah. like dominoes uh now that is a result of what's happening globally in terms of the inflation story yeah uh, many of these banks uh, all banks including the sri lankan banks hold uh, government securities or government treasuries right. uh so us is called treasuries we, we have government securities here yeah. Yeah. uh so that portfolio generally are fixed asset portfolios fixed income portfolios rather yeah. uh so if there is a uh, if there is a movement in inflation and inflation spikes and monetary policy follows the inflation trend where they're trying to rein in inflation and curtail further rises by increasing interest rates those portfolios tend to take a loss because there is an inverse correlation between the uh, price of the bond and inflation okay so if interest rates pick up prices fall if if in, in, interest rates come down prices rise right. uh so this particular aspect was the key trigger for uh this silicon valley silicon bank, valley bank uh, because they had a large portfolio of uh, us treasuries yeah. which had to be marked to market and that marked to market had significant losses and once people got wind of those losses there was panic setting and so as a result of that panic people went to the banks and started pulling out their funds because they thought this is also similar to what happened during the mortgage crisis back in 2008 2009 yeah and as a result of that silicon valley bank went under yeah. and i think there are other banks also in the same pool which are now being scrutinized and there is some concern about some of the top banks uh, in the us that might also end up in a similar stressful situation yeah. in sri lanka is also the same Yeah. Uh, Sri Lanka, we have many of the banks who hold these particular fixed income securities as part of their liquidity ratios, yeah. and it's a it's a mandatory requirement that banks hold an X percentage because it contributes to the bank's liquidity. Yeah. But when interest rates move against these portfolios and they are marked to market, their losses have to be accounted for. Some of these it depend on how the account instruct how they accounted for. Some of them are. in the trading portfolio some of them are recorded in the whole to maturity portfolio which means that people don't really mark to market on a regular basis whereas in a trading portfolio it has to be more dynamic and the pnl gets impacted fairly quicker than the whole to maturity portfolio nevertheless both these portfolios have to be uh, at its fair value and when you do that if there are losses it has to be taken into the bank's capital base and if the bank's capital base is not sufficient enough then you are in a dire situation and in sri lankan situation bank's capital is a concern because yeah. you can't go to the markets neither can you go to the domestic market or the international market because the cost of capital is so high you can't go and raise dollars at 30% right because the sovereign bond is at 35% yeah. you can't go to the rupee market because the <laughs> treasury bill rates and the treasury bond rates come and government borrowing rates at 30%. So a corporate or a bank that goes to the market will have a 
to pay a premium above that. We have seen some banks already take that route in Sri Lanka. Uh, some of the private banks have already taken that route and anticipating this particular bond haircut that is going to come through and anticipating that the impact of high interest rates will hit. I have already gone to the market and secured some capital, but I don't know if that's going to be sufficient because I think now central bank is already doing a stress testing and the results of that will be known and I think some remedial measure should come about from that particular analysis. Right. Doctor, very shortly, uh, if you can give in a very brief method, what should we be doing right now in Sri Lanka? What should we be looking at? Well, for me, I think we are at crossroads in the sense that we, I mean, over the years since 1965, we have uh, decided to industrialize and then gain deindustrialize. We are at that crossroad now. We were planning to industrialize, yeah. now we are deindustrializing. Yeah. So we are going into a trading type of environment, trading model, yeah. where you can import everything, have a 10% value addition and export, export yeah. or you consume. Yeah. And in that trading model is what I think they're trying to institutionalize. And with that trading model that would get institutionalized after the restructure, I think then yeah. the local capitalist base will have to rethink their business model and also move away from production because I think production will be at its uh, final stages in Sri yeah. Lanka. All right, Doctor, a lot of other things that we could have spoken to you, but uh, as usual, time has come against us. Senior Economist and Business Cycle Analyst at Econsult Asia, Dr. Kenneth De Silva, thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank all of our viewers for staying with us. I think a very important discussion that we had here. Stay with us on Other 24 as we bring to you the contemporary topics and breaking it down uh, and break it down for the benefit of the viewers from all angles. This, this is Other 24 and Daniel Tanwasan. Have a great night.